political panel for Thursday. We're delighted to welcome uh, uh, Ellie May O'Hagan, Director of Centre for Labour and Social Studies. Ellie May, welcome to Talk Drive. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much indeed for being on. And Bill Bowkett, reporter at Reaction and political commentator with Young Voices UK. Bill, welcome to Talk Drive. Very good evening. Thank you. Good evening. So, good Lord, you're both looking very intelligent, which frightens me slightly as you both got glasses on. Uh, thank you very much indeed for tuning in and taking time. Um, I spent a turgid hour of my life yesterday uh, listening to Boris Johnson talk, in my mind, about nothing uh, specific or substantial. Um, in terms of what the British public are feeling, in London today, they are undoubtedly following uh, the chief medical officer's advice slash the government's. Do you two believe that there is mass overreaction? Do we think we are being realistic? And do you think Christmas slash the new year is going to be massively affected? I'll start with you, Ellie May O'Hagan. I think there's so much that we don't know about Omicron yet that I think there's an element of wait and see. Yeah. Um, and I think that at the moment, and perhaps we'll talk about this in more detail later, I think that even though there are no formal restrictions at the moment beyond working from home if you can and masks in certain places, definitely what I have noticed, and I'm sure that both of you have seen the same thing as well, that people are cancelling social events a yeah. lot. Yeah. And what that means is we're sort of going into a bit of a de facto lockdown and that's having a huge impact on hospitality businesses in particular. <clears throat> so I think what I'm really keen to see is immediate help for the hospitality sector because these are people who work in businesses, they run businesses, they've done nothing wrong, they've done nothing to create this situation, but they are really paying the price. So that's what I would really like to see. As Where do you imagine just 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 being completely? Sp I mean, I agree with you. We just had Aldo Zilli on, but one of the biggest criticisms of Boris Johnson in the last few months is this: let's spend, spend, spend money that we haven't got. Where, where do you imagine that money should come from, then, Ellie May? Well, I think what we've seen over and over again in this pandemic is that we're all connected. Um, you know, we know that if one of us gets sick, then lots of other people get sick. And I think what we've seen as well is that we're all connected in terms of the money that we earn and the jobs that we have. So if people start losing money um, because they've lost their jobs, that then, that then affects other elements of the economy because it means that they can go out to eat less, they can buy fewer things. Um, and we've seen that in this country, we've actually suffered more than any other European country in terms of the economy. So I think actually now is the time mm. to invest in our people and to support our people, because I think I've got a very um, an attitude towards the economy, which is, uh, you know, uh, if you look after the penny, the pounds will look after themselves. And I think that can be applied to the economy. So if you look after the people, the economy will take care of itself. Thank you, and Bill. I think Bill, what do you make of that? If I can just cut in. Thank you, Ellie May. Bill, what do you say to that? I think I completely echo most of what I think Ellie has been saying. I think, frankly, if you've got someone like Chris Whissey that's making a declaration, you know, in front of millions of people of an Omicron emergency um, and also to prioritise social gatherings in the run up to Christmas, understandably, people are going to become anxious. Yeah. Just look at the streets of London last night. It was frankly astonishing how quiet it was at this time of the year. Um, and I think what I find most shocking, um, to, I think about last night in particular, was first of all, and we've been seeing it a lot during a pandemic, the tussle between the scientific advisors and ministers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been highlighted by that viral tweet that Joe Morrissey did, the Tory MP, uh, about elected representatives making the decisions, uh, you know, not advisors. But the other thing also is that they went forward uh, with these plan B measures, you know, coronavirus passports, mandatory face coverings, guidance to work from home, and potentially even further restrictions going forward, um, you know, without any financial assistance for businesses who are going to be, you know, dramatically affected by this, not just the most wonderful time of year, but also the most profitable. Well, uh, well I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you both. Well. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something that I think. I mean, I think, I think it's, I, I've sat here for weeks and, and, and people are... Uh, well, I was going to say dismissive of what the government's advice is, but I agree with you both. Uh, today, London's deserted. This office is deserted. And whether they're listening uh, to the chief medical officer or Boris Johnson, people are heeding the advice. 
12 months ago, the British public said that Boris Johnson was slow on the uptake. 12 months later, they're saying that he's taking things too quickly to summit. There was a massive, massive difference last night at that press conference. He was saying, go ahead and wish he was painting a far darker picture. You talk about business, though, and this is what I th and I and I've said this as well for a while. Um, you know, yes, the support to the hospitality industry. I agree with you, Ellie Mae. Where's the chancellor? He happens to be in California, which politically, whether people like me to criticise Rishi Sunak or not, because apparently he's the anointed one, has worked out pretty damn well for him because he is nowhere to be seen. And I think Rishi Sunak should be back here talking to industry and saying this is how we're going to help you if Omicron takes over as we might believe it will do. I think he's rather left Boris Johnson to face the flak. And I think that says a lot about what's going on inside the Tory party. Would you both agree, Ellie? Absolutely. Um, I did see that just before we came on air, he released a statement that was actually not very good. It was just saying we'll keep talking to industry leaders. But um, I'm I uh, have a restaurant near me that I really love and I get their newsletter and the founder of the restaurant um, emailed people in the newsletter earlier this week to say that they've lost all of their bookings over the Christmas and New Year period, including one group that hired the whole venue out has cancelled and you can understand of course why people are doing that i had to cancel our christmas party because i felt it wasn't fair to staff to sort of put them in that situation where they might have felt uncomfortable but you know that's a that's a real catastrophe for some businesses and they really need cash now you know these things have been cancelled now and they've bought stock and they've hired staff and they've they've paid a lot of things and they you know, they really need money right now Otherwise, they will be facing a really difficult Christmas and they may not make it through. But you didn't. When I asked you, I, I'm not saying I disagree with you at all. But when I asked you, you didn't answer me in very simple terms. Where are you going to get the money from? Because we're billions in debt. Where are you going to get the money from? Well, I think what we've seen. So, you know, if you look at something like the Second World War, which was another example of Britain going through a big crisis, mm -hmm. basically. And at that time, instead of saying, well, now is the time to cut back because we've spent billions and billions of pounds on a war what we actually did as a country was we came together and we invested in people we created the nhs and we created a system because remember that we own the bank of england it's not like a normal bank it's a bank that the government controls so we created a system there where we didn't have to pay that back in such a way that it would actually harm people so you're you know, saying print money and give it out and pay for things I'm saying do whatever it takes to make sure that but people then it, but put food I, I, on the table. Again, I, and I haven't met you before, and don't take this the wrong way, but that's exactly what the Labour Party did in the 70s and destroyed the economy by printing money and inflation went through the roof and every single union demanded a 30% increase in their wages or they went on strike. That's and why I the think, country was screwed. I think what's happened in the last 10 years is what, you, what you've seen in the last 10 years is um, the government has reacted, reacted to the financial crisis by cutting lots and lots of money and yeah. now we're seeing... The results of that, which yep. is a chronically underfunded NHS and the fact that millions of people in this country have really struggled to cope with the basics of getting through this pandemic because there's been no investment to support them. I, I so wouldn't I think disagree that with that, me, although I'd probably disagree that the, the NHS is underfunded. I would suggest that the NHS is badly run and the money's not spent right. But that's just a personal opinion. Bill, what would you say of what Ellie Mae said? I agree in part with what she says. How do we pay for this support? Yes, that is a big question. And uh, actually, one of the solutions uh, which a lot of um, industry leaders have been putting forward, uh, like the uh, the Nighttime Association, the, you know, the trade body for, um, you know, nightclubs, you know, nighttime economy makes huge amounts of money at this moment in time is, um, is to extend those VAT cuts yeah. uh, for businesses going forward. Because I think the predicament the government's in at the moment, and Rishi Sunak has also commented that you know the booster program or future vaccine programs uh will mean that you know the treasury will have to cut back on spending commitments going forward so that's maybe something to consider uh for one but the other thing also um is that you've got to mitigate the impacts that the you know the last few weeks or you know potentially going forward will have do you want to manage it in terms of what we're seeing today with the bank of england and increasing uh, you know, interest rates to balance with inflation, uh, or do you, you know, carry on schemes like Kickstart uh, and other, you know, uh, bonds and also um, support packages and play uh, so that for going forward, that's the way in which it would help 
uh, the economy through the through the difficult it, winter. It is, so is it not, is a huge predicament, and I myself can't even say where the funding exactly is going. It to come is not from, the truth. Go think of the long term effects. It is not the truth that we all actually agree with each other. There have been mixed messages. Um, my biggest gripe, um, which I'm sure people have heard, is that a year ago the government should not have said if you have two vaccines the world will be ended in terms of COVID and we can all get on with our lives. They should have said it will deal with this, but like flu, the strange one, it'll mutate and we'll need different vaccines, but this will get over this bump in the road. We're all in this together. We're going to make mistakes. We were led to believe everything would be fine and patently it's not. Um, I've listened to all the people argue about, you know, <clears throat> doesn't make you ill. I've listened to all the people say it transmits far quicker than Delta. I, I've listened to it all and all. The truth of the matter is this country is in a very difficult position. And um, I, I believe we have to learn to live with it. I believe quite rightly with you, Ellie Mae, that, that we need to support certain businesses. The problem is that the minute that is that is done, everybody needs support. Then there's no money. Then everybody says we're giving money away. It's an incredibly difficult position, uh, which is why I want to move on to a lighthearted finish, because I've been talking about this for 400 years and my brain's hurting. A publisher, I'm waiting for your response to this, urges parents to ditch classics like Peter Rabbit and the Famous Five. Ellie May O'Hagan, why is that? Um, well, I read this article, it was in the Daily Mail, I think, and I have to say that, I mean, I don't have children, but if I did, they would be getting Peter Rabbit because Peter Rabbit, it was my favourite of all time. <laughs> and I think it's quite a beautiful thing when your parents share their, their childhood memories with you and, and that is passed down. But so, you know, that, that definitely is where I stand on the Peter Rabbit issue. Um, but, you know, in that article as a whole, there were, there were a couple of uh, books that were recommended that were about accepting LGBT parents, which I think is is fine because actually a lot of children do get bullied in school. But there was also other things like, you know, helping uh, children to cope with loss or fear, which I think is, you know, this the last couple of years has been really stressful and traumatic for children. So I think those are quite good things. And what they actually said, this publisher, was not you should not read these books, but just that you should sort of expand the amount of books that you read because that's why good do, for Why education. can't we just let kids be kids? What's gone wrong with the world? I don't, I know I'm boring and old and 56, Bill, but it's get, we, we're going to cancel everything and change everything and apologise for everything and skirt over everything and we're just going to become beige, aren't we? Look, I can comment on cancer culture as much as I want and you can read it, you know, with a pinch of salt. And I think while it's right, you know, to be in, for children to be inquisitive, uh, you know, and to basically not be dictated what they can read or not. And I do think it's beautiful, like Ellie said, to, you know, have a parent, you know, hand over a book that they read as a child. You know, I wouldn't be able to read likes of Orwell or the Asterix or the Tin. Yeah, but hold on a it. second. You're not allowed to have your kids sit on your knee anymore and read a bedtime <laughs> story, are Because when the look, European is, court will accuse you of something. But do you know what I think? I, I don't think the problem necessarily is, is that uh, with, with what Oxford University Press is saying, um, that, uh, you know, that uh, you need to be more expanded, open-minded in what you're reading. The problem I have, and they haven't really addressed this, is that children aren't reading enough. That's the one problem that I have. Is I think uh, only a quarter of uh, young children, I think under 18, read regularly every single day. I think it's better to address that and then just let society take its tide and let children, you know, be open you know to different ideas I, and I'm, I'm being shouted at to move on you've been an absolute pleasure Ellie May have you got a personal collection of Peter Rabbit no but uh, your producer did suggest that I share that when I was a child I had an imaginary friend called Peter which I named after Peter Rabbit so there Ellie you go. May Hagen I love you forever <laughs> for that this is Talk Drive